morning. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so just to, just to put it into perspective, we put both terms, impact and innovation, into our titles. So Beck Center for Social Impact and Innovation, because we wanted to throw all the terms in there in one place. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is a little bit about kind of where the world is going on social innovation. To some extent, we can define it as the projects that we do, what the government is doing, what the private sector is doing. But really where the change is taking place is every one of those places is dramatically changing. And what it's going to require is creating new models. So I'm going to go through with several of the trends and then talk a little bit about why each of these are important and what's changing in that. And really what you all are doing is figuring out where those new models are. But what I hope you keep in mind as you think about those new models is what else needs to change in order for your model to succeed. Where does policy need to change? How does the private sector need to think about it differently? What should the nonprofit sector be doing differently? And where are the collaborative opportunities for that to happen? So as I mentioned, the world is transforming. Industries that used to be around are changing dramatically. Media is no longer the same media as you talked about 20 years ago. Today, medium is media as much as CBS is media. The hotel industry is changing. What used to be you had to go to a hotel, get a hotel room or a motel, today you can do Airbnb. It's not the same thing. Phones are changing. Mobile phones are doing everything from being a way to actually communicate with people to being used for mobile money. So if you think traditional industries aren't changing, they are changing. But one of the biggest trends that we're seeing is a move from moving from a linear world to a networked world. Linear was, if I do X, Y will happen. Instead, it's not true. Sometimes trends change and you're beginning to see networking happen. One of the best examples of that is the Black Lives Matter movement. Does anybody know who the head of Black Lives Matter is? There's no head. It's in all different places. The movement is mothers, fathers, individuals, community members standing up for something that they believe in. They're both a connector and they're a catalyst. Everything is now collaborative. <laughs> We're programming everything together. So I can see when I'm at work what's happening in my house with the temperature regulation. I can see where I need to go very quickly before having to get in my car to do that. We have the ability to program our objects. And no longer is it a linear route. I can take multiple routes. How many of you use Waze? Right? There's no one route anymore. You don't just have to take X road. Now they can tell you on a real-time basis where to go and how to do that. So it's no longer linear. It's a network. We're taking information from the network. We're offering to you where the opportunities are. Moving from siloed to collaborative. How many feel like the world is siloed? Right? If you do healthcare, you only do healthcare. If you do education, you only do education. If you do energy, you only do energy. But no longer does that work. Crowdfunding. It allows people from across the globe to have impact at scale. You don't have to wait for one individual funder to give you money. You can crowd it in. And this one's Flowhive is such an interesting example. It's probably the most successful of the crowdfunding sites at the time. $12.2 million in 72 hours. They crowd it in. It's using a network effect of people you know to individually invest. Flowhive is one example, but I know a lot of arts organizations, media organizations, who um, if you're an artist, it's really hard to get access to capital. But if you use your networks well, you actually can. I've funded films. I've funded artists. But I've seen lots of this happening. Crowdfunding is an interesting opportunity to move from silo to collaborative. You don't have to stay in your lane. You can actually look across the lane and see. <clears throat> Siloed industries are converging together. Now here's an interesting idea. Use your municipal ID card, your card that you use as your ID, as your credit card. It's allowing more local communities and more poor communities to have access to finance. Because now they're getting all of their services onto this card. All the, 
All of their uh, payments that they're supposed to get from the government are coming onto this card. This is in Oakland. It's being tested out. It's no longer siloed. But what else, if we can do these things, what else should we be doing? Where else can we take something that exists as a credit card, something that exists as social services, and something that exists as your municipal ID, to combining them to have one card that can do all of those things for a person? What if we were to rethink finance and have start access to finance for every poor person out there? What would that look like? How would you do it? How might you think about it? Some of you are already doing it. We're moving from top down to bottom up. We're used to solving big problems, especially in the social sector. We're used to solving the big problems, defining what the solution is, and then delivering the solution. But there, one of the things that we believed very clearly in the White House is solutions exist in communities all around us. How do we take that bottom up and give it a, va a face? What can we do with that? How many of you know about We the People? This started as a way to allow the community to ask the president or the White House or the government to do something. We the People became an online petition of where 100,000, if you can get 100,000 signatures, the administration responds to you. The government responds to you. Now, you would think getting 100,000 signatures is easy, but it is not. But if you're motivated, you can get 100,000 signatures. Net neutrality did that. It then allowed the FCC to open up the process of comments on net neutrality, which got one million comments from the United States on net neutrality before, that law was, before the rules were put in place. That's the power of the collaborative. That's the power of bottom-up, not just a top-down methodology, but really using your network effectively. Participatory budgeting. It seems like a really small idea that communities should be able to invest to be able to tell you where they want to spend their money in their communities, but it's not. Instead, you have to go to a city council meeting, which is from 12 to 2 in the afternoon. If you can't go to the city council meeting, you can't actually tell where you want the money allocated. This started in Brazil, in the favelas, where the government put computers they put uh, easy ways for people to come in and say, where do you want to spend your money? It is now in 1,500 cities around the world. It is an opportunity for communities to allocate their dollars on what they think is the most important place they should spend their money. Now imagine if policymakers were to take that information and say, where should we be investing much larger dollars? Where should we be putting infrastructure dollars? Right now, these are small amounts of money, but there is a huge opportunity for, for people to participate to be a part of the solution, as opposed to being told what the solution is. We're moving from incremental changes to exponential changes. The driverless car. You can't open a newspaper today without talking about driverless cars. It's taking us from this idea that something could drive itself to actually driving itself. And they're all small pieces, right? So right now, maybe the car itself isn't working, but if you have a car that helps you park, if you have the technology in your car that helps you park, it's part of the driverless car. If you have a navigation system built in, it's part of what the driverless car came, the concept came up with. But no longer are we just thinking about small solutions. How do I incrementally change something? It's thinking about the vision of where could we go. What if we had a driverless car? It could drive lots of things in the process of change. So what if we in the social sector were to think differently about that? And I'll put one idea on the table for you all to think about. What if the driverless car became the new transportation route for the poor? Instead of waiting for large transportation systems to be where communities have to get to, what if the car itself became the transportation route? What would that look like? How can we imagine what that change could be? 3D printing. We just talked about it earlier this morning. 3D printing has the potential to, from prosthetic limbs to shipping very small containers, opportunities, whatever is being built to communities that don't have access to big technologies. Could you take the 3D printer, move it into regional spaces, and allow that to be, spent, to be sent to communities that actually need 
the technologies and not worry about building large technology systems that no one can afford to buy and try to finance it over 50 years. Instead, what you have is the ability to disrupt industries. What you have the ability is to come up with a solution, make the solution, and apply the solution. That's what 3D printing has to offer. The challenge is to figure out how do we make it work and what, is the way we're, what are the new business models, what are the new models to make this happen? Because the traditional industries, they don't like this idea. They're used to building the systems and selling them. But the opportunity is to think about those solutions. We're moving from a controlled world to an open world. Now, for someone who's worked in government, this is terrifying, right? Because you're controlling the message. We're going to tell you what the message is, and then you're going to believe us. All of a sudden, the message is whatever anybody wants it to be. And we have to learn how to deal with that. And as a government, we had to learn how do you live in an open world where every bit of information, whatever is supposed to be a private meeting is no longer private, it's always public. How do you live in an open world and be authentic at the same time? Open government platforms like Open Africa are allowing data systems to be shared amongst countries, amongst agencies, amongst different places. And it's transforming the way governments are looking at their own data to make changes in their communities. It seems like a small idea. It seems easy to say, let's just open up data. That would be the easy thing to do, and then just everybody will use it. But if you're in government, you're not even sure what that means. Like, what data are we talking about? What have we been collecting? Are we even collecting anything that's useful? So the open movement is really making us think about what it is we're doing and why it's important that the public have ac access to it. It's also why if you could link this to, to participatory budgeting, how you can use that information to make that change. Oh, sorry, going forward. Crowdsourcing public works in London. Now, how interesting is this? If you want to have a project, a public works project in your community, you can actually crowdsource what that looks like, raise the money for it, and ask the government to implement it. Interesting way of thinking about tax dollars differently and what that looks like. But this allows us to think about what it means from going to closed systems of we're going to build this transportation route, we're going to build that transportation route, to what do we want in our communities? What do we actually need in our communities and why do we need it? Oh, I keep pushing the wrong button. Uh-oh. Um, the aim here is to say change is the new normal. There is no traditional industry. There's no traditional change. There's no traditional way of doing it. Finance companies don't even know what to do with social impact because there's no data out there. They'll tell you that a million times. It's because there's no model that knows how to measure what impact actually is. Nobody knows how to measure social enterprise. Nobody knows what communities. We've not looked at communities as sources of information. We've not looked at communities as something we can work with. In fact, we've done everything from the top-down methodology. So change is the new normal. That's the world that you all are living in. That's the businesses, organizations, enterprises you all are creating. They're causing change, but know that there's no model that is easy because you're changing everything from the way finance operates to the way collaboration happens to the way information is sourced to the way you're applying it. Everything is a constant source of change. And what I would urge you to do is learn how to operate within change. Don't look for the perfect model, because there's no perfect model. What you're going to learn about is how to manage to change and constantly adapt to change on a regular basis. What you get the chance to do in that process, and it's a great opportunity. It's also a challenge, but the opportunity is you get to lead the next wave. What are the structures we're going to put in place that in the next 50 years, someone will say, thank God somebody did that? What are you all going to do to make those structures happen? How are you going to make it work for yourselves? And what I hope you will keep in mind is not just about the individual things you all do, but the things that you can do collaboratively to change the system. And the system is also government. Government is the single largest funder of social services in the world. 
In New York City alone, the government spends $22 billion a year in social services. $22 billion. There's no foundations put together that much money to spend that much in one city. So if you want to make change, also think about how government is going to make that change happen. Certainly change the finance industry. Certainly take on industries that you're working with. But don't forget about how to change government. How do you use the online petition like we the people? How would you make people think about new models of public-private partnerships? How do we make sure B Corp becomes a real tax ent entity and not just an interesting idea? How do we make sure risk models incorporate impact into corporate business models as well as government business models to make sure social impact is a risk that people are looking at. If you're not doing something on social impact, it's a bigger risk than if you are doing something on social impact. How are you going to make those changes? But with that, the big stuff is overwhelming. Think about the little things that you can do to make that change happen. Because that's the opportunity you all have. What are the small things we can do that have tremendously large impact? That's transforming. That's transformational and y'all are leading it. I hope that in my lifetime, I get to just create the avenues for these changes to happen, but to see what emerges out of it, because I, I don't even know what the new normal looks like. So create the new normal. Thank you. So now we're going to ask a couple quick questions. Um, and we've got a few questions that have come in through Twitter. I forgot to mention Classy Innovate, uh, hashtag Classy Innovate, if you have any questions specific to this session. And we have different uh, hashtags for each one. If there are any questions in the audience, you can raise your hand. I can't really see you very well, so I'm going to uh, count on some of the other people out there to, to call it out. But we do have, I'm going to start with a couple that uh, came in. So the first question. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs in this room to adapt to constant change? And what do you task us with doing? So that's a great question. And I think the things that you all need to look at is you're constantly getting data and in, input on what's happening in your, in your organizations. See where it's going and adapt. If you see it's not working, don't spend 10 years. Now look, here's the challenge that y'all will face, especially for those of you that get philanthropy funding, is they fund for five years in the way that they thought the model should look like. And you'll keep, doing, you'll keep doing the work that you're doing, and you're finding it's not working. Use that data to make that change happen. And also see where the trends are going, because that's what businesses do well, right? They don't actually keep, the reason Google succeeds and Facebook succeeds is they're seeing where people are going, and they're adapting to where that is. You also need to know and understand what are communities actually looking for. Don't just manage to your funders, manage to your communities. What do they need? What types of issues do they want? What are the things that they care about? Under matters a lot. I guess I was breathing heavy. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Um, next one. Uh, you pr probably could have predicted this one. Um, how can social entrepreneurs work with the White House to create change, and should they even try? I think the last point that you made here about working with government was interesting. How would you encourage social entrepreneurs, particularly those in this room, to work with um, other governments, either locally or at the national yeah. level? I, um, th wow, um, I wish I was in government because I could actually, would have, you know, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, when he was putting, when they were doing the, uh, when they were doing some of the, some of the big bills, uh, went to the community and said, here's what we want to do, now make me go do it. Hmm. The thing I would tell you is think about the collective that each of you have. And how would you go talk to the government on what you need? Is it new finance mechanisms? Is it recognition? Is it tax mechanisms? But you need to do it not just individually. You need to actually come together and saying, this is what we want. It was the, one of the biggest challenges that I faced in the White House when we were there, is that people would come to us individually. And I was like, so is this five people problem? Is it a 100 person problem? What do you want us to do as a collective? Because the more you push us, or the more you would have pushed us, the more we could have done. We fought as much as we could internally, but what it really required is lots of people. If a thousand of you came and said to the White House, we want an Office of Social Innovation, we want to be able to participate in the next thing you do on changing the car industry, or we want to participate in what you're doing on agriculture, people pay attention. But you have to show up. Get on the online petitions. Go talk to your congressman. And let me just say, 
A thousand phone calls changes a vote. Think about the potential of that. A thousand phone calls changes a vote. What are we doing to ask for that change? What do you want? Do you want to be in the new tax brackets for B Corps? Do you want B Corps to be in a new tax bracket? What, do you, what can we do about that? So what you can do is push the White House for that information. There's no guarantee that the next White House has an Office of Social Innovation. Every government, get, every president gets to set up their office. Push for it. Ask for it. Ask for what you want and don't be afraid because they say no the first time, not to come back the second time, not to come back the third time, not to come back the fourth time. Timing matters. It's all about timing. Interesting. All right. I think we have time for one last question here. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase this one a little bit. But you spoke about a lot of transformational ideas up there. Which one is your favorite? Um, and which one do you think can be implemented um, in the near term to provide the greatest amount of change? <laughs> um, so I, I'll, I'll start with, I'm a systemic thinker, so I don't actually think there's any one solution that matters at all times. I think the idea that crowdfunding is happening, 3D printing is happening, participatory budgeting happening, all matters at the same time. Because in order for the system to change, if we all just did our little piece of it, but the other people weren't doing their piece of it, it doesn't change. So what really matters and why conferences like this really matter a lot is all of you are doing slightly different things. All of you are doing slightly different things that are not similar to somebody else. But when all of you are doing it together, it starts to, it starts to bubble up change. And people are like, wow, it's happening in science. It's happening in agriculture. It's happening in criminal justice. Maybe there's something we should be paying attention to. So keep all of them going, because there's no one winner. All of them need to happen at the same time. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you thank very you. much for coming up here. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.